Hey, we're now being recorded. Cool. Okay, so um, I've got a Google uh, Doc going, which is open. Anyone can contribute to it. I thought things you might want to put in there are other topics we might consider, um, a better format than this, so it's not me. Um, a different platform if you want to switch to Zoom or something. I'm happy yeah, with that. I just grabbed this one because it's the one I happen to have a license for. Um, any resources um, that you think might be useful to add there? So, you know, just anything about this session you want to put in there, feel free. Um, if someone wants to take notes on this session, they can put it in there. Um, so, uh, this one, this session is about student support. Um, and there are people who are here from the OU are probably better qualified than me to talk about it, people who, who perform the associate lecturer role. Um, I have been an OU student though, so I do have that perspective. So I've done a couple of masters with the OU. So I thought some of the things we might want to consider or people might want to ask questions about, but it's completely open. Um, I think one of the things we often take for granted just because we see it, we don't sort of notice it in a way is the kind of work that a physical space does in organizing learners. You know, they know where to be to receive content, they know where to go to get resources, they know where to appear to have uh, discussions and those kind of things. Um, and a physical campus does all that work for them. And when they're in, when they're then left to study on their own, a lot of that structure disappears and has to be, has to be reproduced. Um, this tends to place quite a bit of responsibility on, on the learner to organise their time often. Um, and what uh, or George Siemens uh, was talking online uh, this week about sort of studying at a distance, and he used the term coherence. And I think there's, a, there's an element of that. So the learner themselves has to kind of pull together different resources, different parts of their learning, and make them coherent, which is perhaps done a bit more for them in a physical space. Um, on the plus side, it also gives them a bit more agency if you're not necessarily just making people sit down and do, you know, five hours of face-to-face -face lectures at the time, if you're moving to a more asynchronous role uh, and delivery, then it gives people more agency about when they choose to study, what activities they want to do, when, and those kind of things. So there, there are kind of benefits from that. Um, might it be interesting to discuss the differences that we get with online, both good and bad, um, and how that and how you're sort of coming to terms with those. I think um, perhaps an important part is the kind of emotional support. Um, I think Again, perhaps that, that kind of appears almost by default in a face-to-face -face setting. People get to know each other. They can go to a counsellor. They can you know, just chat to people. Um, and it, you can feel very isolated studying alone, you know, um, studying at your home or something without anyone else to talk to about it. So how we can help with that emotional support. And I think that's actually a really important part of learning. Uh, that I think people are beginning to appreciate, but... Um, wasn't always to the fore. Um, elements of monitoring, good and bad, I think. You know, it's, it's much more difficult to know how you're doing as a lecturer or a tutor um, when you're at a distance. If, if you're giving a lecture and everyone's falling asleep, you can pretty much, you know, you might need to change tack. Or if you know that the, the room's empty, you know, maybe something going wrong. Or attendance, if you haven't seen someone on campus for ages. So all those elements of, of what we should monitor, and perhaps what we shouldn't, you know. Student, students don't necessarily like to feel like they're being monitored all the time. Um, how we can promote communication, both in terms of collaborative activities, uh, but also kind of the social interaction. And also leads on to the last point around motivation. So um, we did some uh, work, for instance, on uh, designing for retention. And one of the big motivating factors for students to complete is that they form social bonds with other students. And that can be more difficult uh, when you're studying at a distance or online. Um, so just trying to help students stay motivated um, and how you can do that. Maybe that comes down to course design that, that needs to be rethought. So um, all of those, I think, are good topics, but feel free to completely ignore them and, uh, and go with something else. Um, so that's it. That's me throwing the ball for you to run and catch now. So does anyone have a specific question or a point they want to raise, uh, perhaps based on things I've just done there? I see Anne's been talking about things you want to speak, Anne. Perhaps one of the ALs might want to come in and uh, speak from their experience. If not, I'm going to pick on Nigel.
Okay, Anne, I'm going to give you a uh, call. So, Kathy, I'm going to give Anne, and I'm going to give Kathy uh, microphone access. So, you should have microphone access now, Anne. Remember, it was where you can see me talking. If you just to, uh, put your mouse over that little um, microphone. There we are. Hello, can you, can you me? hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll turn my mic yeah. off. <laughs> I'm getting the hang of this now. Um, so, um, yeah, I just wanted to, to highlight some of the points of engagement. So somebody said in the chat around um, keeping cameras on and uh, student support so that they're engaged. Um, it, and that can be a bit disconnected when uh, they're at a distance and you can't quite um, see how they're engaging and how to support them. But I think that's changing the style of, say, how you um, um, support learning for them and actually being a bit more interactive um, and allowing them to speak up. I've, I've, um, I was in a, a, where we were talking at another session where having two people, somebody to moderate the chat helps to sort of like support that interactivity and provide the support for students. The other thing I wanted to say was around um, resilience, allowing students when you talked about student support, how can you enable them to be resilient when they get stuck? Um, and with having um, three university students home now from different universities, um, that the thing that they're finding is uh, with now being totally all online, it's like a little pool of me testing how it's working for them. And one of the things that they're feeling is this isolation and not having mechanisms to be able to connect back. Um, the, the academics are tending to just almost translate their current practices, just stick it online have the uh, presentation or a lecture and they're not allowing that sort of feedback of I'm stuck or um, um, enabling them to be resilient and have pathways to find their own way through. So uh, I think we've, we've got to understand that immense feeling of isolation and panic that students can have. Somebody mentioned in the chat here how students are feeling panicked, even our students at the OU are feeling panicked even though they, they have online it still is changing the mode of how we're working with them that's just what I wanted to say anyway thanks Anne um Kathy's got her hand up I'm going to give Kathy microphone access now so you should be able to speak Kathy so if you roll your microphone yep Thank you, Excellent. Hello, I'm Cathy. So I'm an AL at the OU and I'm also a student at the OU. I'm researching synchronous online tuition and I'm an EdD student, a narrative researcher. So I'm gathering stories of students' experiences in online rooms just like this one. And um, yeah, it's fascinating stuff because um, the stuff that students are sharing is really insightful and it's really helping um, us as tutors on the particular module that um, where I'm working with the tutors to, to change practice as we're going along. So the sorts of things that are coming up are how, um, for example, in this room at the moment, we have two ways of communicating. We've got a written conversation going on in the chat window and we've got a verbal conversation and we've got slides on the screen. And for most students, um, that presents a difficulty. It's difficult to know um, which conversation to follow. So a student said to me the other day, in my ideal tutorial, I would just have one conversation going on at once and stop and ask for contributions and questions at particular points um, in the conversation, just like you would in an ordinary classroom. You know, you'd be giving your presentation and then you'd stop and you'd do an activity or you'd stop and you'd ask for questions. And for students who um, are dyslexic, that is particularly important. Um, the other thing that um, I know from my own experience and, and students keep telling me is um, just like you were saying, Martin, it's um, so hard to concentrate and to, to feel engaged when 
Um, when you're online, there's so many distractions. You might think, oh, you know, I wonder what's happened in the news today, or I could be doing a quick online shop at the same time as I'm listening to this person. So you're never fully engaged until you're asked to complete an activity. Um, so there are, there are lots of reasons for making tutorials interactive, but yeah, um, that's, that's just one of them. So I, I will put my, um, I've only got my initial study on my website um, at the moment, but as I go on, I'm adding more student stories to that. So I'll put that there in case that's useful for anybody. Brilliant, thank you, Kathy. Um, I'm gonna give Nigel, uh, hello Dominic, by the way, Dominic's coming from Vietnam. Um, I'm gonna give Nigel, uh, for actually someone asked, sorry, um, and I'm going to give this question to you to answer, Nigel. Um, advice on uh, how we get students to interact online. So I think it was Pam asked that. So I'm going to throw you that curveball, Nigel, and you can answer it. You should have microphone access now. So you need to scroll over the picture of me, pretend you're hitting me with the mouse and you should be able to talk, Nigel. While I'm waiting for Nigel to talk, if you want to, uh, Dominic says, I'm finding the experience of teaching online suddenly unexpected, very disorientating. Uh, I'm next to you, but now, oh, Nigel. I think I can see your end come up, so you should be able to speak. The little microphone, you can click it to go green. Uh, so what, sorry, Dominic was saying, um, so your approach is normally very traditional. So I think there's a kind of a double uh, hit, if you like, there, Dominic, in that, um, when you go online, you also want to implement maybe a different pedagogy as well, which is not what they're used to either, kind of maybe more more kind of interactive and collaborative. Okay, nice, why are you speaking? We can't hear Is that you. better? Hello. Yay, there he Yay. is. Okay. My name's Nigel Gibson. I'm an Open University Associate Lecturer and I'm a staff tutor. I was an educational advisor. I've done this for a while. Martin's question was about, I think Martin threw in the idea that students don't, don't get together online in the way they might do face to face, which I find surprising given that um, I'm still part of a group that met 20 years ago when there were students on the module that Martin um, chaired for the Open University. I think students can do it, but I think it's, and going back to the thing about how we get them to engage with each other. I think it's important to recognize that they need to do the socialization. We need to give people space to start trusting each other before they'll share ideas with each other, before they'll say to each other, I'm not confident about this. They won't do that unless you've given them space to, to break down all the other barriers that are around them. So it's that thing about letting them talk to each other in a non-threatening way about where they live, where they come from, whether or not they've had this bloody virus, whether or not, what did they think of the, the rugby over the weekend, whether or not they've seen any pictures of Martin's dog for a while. But, but that's part of, before they can do the other stuff, they need to get that going. Does that cover what you were asking for, Martin? Uh, I think it wasn't me who asked the question, so uh, was it? Um, ask the question. Um, so depends if she wants to come back on that. But yes, I, I agree. And when I said they can't interact, I, I didn't mean they can't interact. I mean, I think if you're coming from a face to face setting and then studying online, um, a lot of that kind of how that social interaction happens is again structured around the kind of physical space. Suddenly you're that's removed from you. So you have to kind of much more explicitly uh, engineer it into, into your design. I think.
So I just put a link in of a post I did about student advice. Um, that are things that I thought were important, but um, I'm sure other people might have one. So uh, one was get organised. Um, and I think that comes back to that point about um, you know you have to take some of that onus on yourself as a student. In other words, get agreement from those around you. I think particularly now if everyone's at home, you know, so I think it can be difficult to get people to respect that space. You know, so maybe you have to have some kind of code. You know, when I put the I'm studying sign on the door, that really means I'm studying. I saw a funny thing on Twitter the other day. Um, a, a, a mum had put a note on the door saying, I'm in a meeting, do not disturb. The answers to your questions are probably in the laundry basket. No, a piece of fruit <laughs> where it was when you last put it. <laughs> um, another piece of advice is get your study space sorted. You know, so, and sometimes I think that can be quite a small thing. It's just like you know, having a couple of things you put around you that make it feel like your space and you feel uh, comfortable. Um, I said engage in online discussions. I know it's not very, it's not for everyone. Sometimes people can feel a bit um, like, oh God, it's another bloody discussion I've got to go into, but um, try and engage in those. Um, my other advice is, is to read carefully, I think. Um, although this is often a problem when people move online very quickly, they, they think what they're saying is very obvious and often it isn't. And one of the things we do with um, OU courses is we have critical readers go through them and I think I've written this perfectly well explained article and they come back and say do you mean this this or this it's like all oh, right okay I hadn't thought about it so like so it's easy to find ambiguity but I think also for students you know they do need to read very carefully about what it is they're being asked to do rather than what they think they're being asked to do. Uh, if unsure ask you know so I think that, you know, getting clarification rather than going off down the wrong route uh, be strategic you know um I found out when I was a student, um, I wasn't a very good student. Well, I wasn't the perfect student, I guess. So, you know, what do I need to get done? Um, and we have all these lovely other activities, but it's kind of like, what do I need to get done? That's kind of core parts of that. I think sometimes you might need to do that. Um, and I said, be patient. I think particularly for people who are new going online, new educators, and lastly, try and enjoy it. I think that was my, my set of things. Right, well, okay. Uh, so Adam says, Tina Rebecca Ferguson talks a lot to us about different types of icebreakers. Um, so Dominic says, my students are unbelievably shy. People more used to European context may find it hard to fathom. Yes, I think that's right, Dominic. It was a kind of a, a cultural thing. Okay, I'm going to get Tina to talk. Tina, you're volunteered. Like Anne volunteered you to me then. So I'm going to give you microphone access to talk about different types of icebreaker. And, Interaction online. Hi. It's a bit quiet if you want to lean closer to the microphone, but we can hear you. You're live. Hello. Hi, Hi. Tina. That's good. That's much better. I'll turn mine off now. Okay. Um, so, uh, two weeks ago, we ran an evidence cafe, uh, which is uh, a methodological approach where participants uh, share knowledge in an informal way. So we would uh, normally run this face to face. And uh, because of the COVID, uh, we had to switch uh, quickly online. And uh, what uh, we actually tried to do uh, was to make everything uh, simpler so that uh, we uh, have people to interact with each other and uh, it was um, it was about uh, the um, uh, icebreakers and that was actually uh, it worked uh, very well although it was a bit long uh, but uh, it uh, gave participants attendees uh, this feeling that uh, they socialize and they engage with each other and uh, because we asked them to uh, talk about uh, uh, two lies and a truth, we also found out who knew whom from the past. So it worked really well. Uh, and then you also, I, I also found out like at that point that I need to be creative. So one of the people, it was his birthday. So I started singing uh, happy birthday in Greek so that I break the eyes and make them feel more comfortable. Um, it, was a, it was very intense. Um, 
Um, but uh, uh, I think uh, what worked really well was that uh, we were adjusting uh, each activity on the way because uh, we had something planned, but uh, in practice it was taking more time. Uh, so it was really, really hard. Uh, so instead of doing three activities, we did two. And uh, we were just honest, uh, so we were, uh, what I was uh, feeling it was most awkward was that people were not using their cameras so much. So I, I had the feeling that I was talking in the vacuum. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. And now I also I couldn't uh, focus uh, very much because I had to host the event. I had to look at the comments that people were writing. I had to move around breakout rooms. So it was, as Ann Adams said earlier, uh, it was very helpful that we had uh, three, um, three people facilitating uh, the discussions. Now I wasn't reading any of the comments, by the way, so that I can focus on what I wanted to say. Uh, that's it. Thanks, Tina. Um, I've tried sharing my screen of the uh, Google Doc. Is that is that what everyone's seeing now? So yeah. Um, okay, cool. So we can you can add things in that Google Doc if you want as a, as a record as you go along. Um, does anybody else want to speak or raise the specific queries that they have around where they are now and things that might be useful in terms of student support? Um, Sorry, okay. Uh, was that, yes, Cathy, you want to raise particular queries? And Anne, I'm going to get, so you should still have microphone access, Cathy, if you want to use that. Uh, and Anne, you can have microphone access. I feel like I'm op Oprah. You get microphone access and you get microphone access. So if, if either of you want to speak, you should be able to now. I don't know if you're saying yes to something else there. Um, it takes ages for the microphone to switch on. You have to go through three different boxes to get it to say yes, it can work. Um, no, we, we were just saying yes to, we could see the, the Google Doc, Martin. Uh, okay, cool. Yes, sorry, yes. That's also part of the delay, isn't it? So now I'm making you say yes to things. Um, cool. Okay, thanks, Anne. Um, good. Um, I think other aspects of... Um, uh, student support that might be interesting that I might get other people to talk on are, are aspects of motivation. Um, and I think, you know, there are, there are quite a few studies that say, you know, students find it more difficult to be motivated when they're studying alone, studying online. Um, so I might lean on some of our AL colleagues to talk about that. Uh, if Kathy or Nigel or someone wants to come in. Yeah, I think I switched my mic back on. Yeah, cool. Go for it. Thanks, Kathy. Yeah, I, I think that's very true. And certainly from talking to the students, um, the participants in my research study, um, they want to interact with other people, not all for the same reasons, but for some of them, it's because they want to feel less isolated. So especially if they're doing a job, where they're working on their own. So one of my research participants is a childminder and she actually plays recorded tutorials over again, over and over so that she can feel part of a community. She feels like she belongs because she's getting that input, even though she would never use the microphone and speak in the tutorial. And um, she would much rather write on the, um, the whiteboard than write in the chat because writing on the whiteboard is anonymous. So um, yeah, there, there are lots of reasons why people want to, to interact and sometimes that's about um, motivation, feeling part of a community and um, the more that we can do to give people those opportunities. So um, Amanda was saying in the, um, in the chat box that activities that are anonymous um, really do help some students and um, yeah, the um, the reluctance to use the microphone. I think every student has mentioned to me without any prompting at all that they prefer not to use the microphone. 
And they've all got different reasons for that, but they all prefer not to do it. They would much rather um, write in the chat box or even better to write on a whiteboard where their contributions are anonymous. And what we really need is um, a whiteboard that you can write on where the contributions don't all end up on top of each other. Yes, yeah, so you can use other link apps, other tools sometimes, things like Padlet, and that can be quite useful. Um, I think in terms of motivation as well, one of the things you know we often do in the OU is design our courses to have early feedback for people. Um, so that's, you know, they kind of feel like they're getting somewhere. Um, so Mentimeter, Tom's suggesting as well. Um, yeah, as a kind of base for people to put stuff. And I agree about the kind of wanting to chat um, in in text boxes and, and, and forums and that. And then one, that can be one of the real benefits, actually, you know, the, the person who never speaks up in class suddenly has a lot to say when they can think more kind of carefully and type it out and stuff. And so that can be a real benefit. And But equally, you can also get some people completely dominate a forum. You have to kind of tread carefully about, why don't you let someone else answer a question or something like that. Um, so there is that kind of message. But I think uh, we did an interesting piece of work once uh, in the US. So we took a, an OU maths course and there was um, a group of people who they needed to pass maths in order to get onto a job scheme or something. Uh, and we reversioned this maths course um, around digital badges, which meant it was you had many more tasks and kind of earlier on. So it was structured around specific tasks to get you a digital badge. Um, and so just that kind of restructuring the course to give early reward, early feedback was actually really useful. And like, um, these are people who had never managed to pass math, maths, math in America. Uh, and they got like a kind of 80% pass rate. So just that restructuring the course around specific tasks, that you then get some kind of credit for. And I think, you know, digital badges, people have different views. And some people think they're good. Other people are a bit trivial. Well, I think it wasn't so much the badges as the, the structuring around tasks to give people early feedback and feel like they're always kind of progressing and getting somewhere in, in quite small chunks kind of helped with that, that, that motivation, I guess. Um, okay, who wants to speak now or ask a question? So any of our people who are having to switch online um, do you have any particular issues around student support or helping students or are your, are your students in particularly, have you got worries about certain types of student who may not have good places to study that we can perhaps offer advice for? I mean, just while people are typing, um, I think the communication is important, but I remember when we first introduced online learning, because of course for the OU, we used to do things like summer schools and that, and when online learning first came along, particularly in the mid nineties, it's like, wow, now we can do collaborative activities. And collaborative activities are actually quite painful online, quite slow and quite stressful. I mean, they're good, but um, they are quite hard work. And I remember a student saying to me like, every bloody week it was another collaborative activity. And like, I don't know what they meant. So I think you know, they're useful and they are good, but um, you need to structure them appropriately and, uh, and not have too many of them and, and be aware they can be a, a kind of a, a black spot a kind of risk risk spot in the in, in your course where people may struggle okay good so i'm gonna so uh some, from an OU perspective it's baby steps to the group one gets to know over a period of time in terms of online work the students and the lecturers have been thrown into this don't have that luxury that's true amanda um i don't know at the moment whether because often there is a lot of research that people who have met face to face then work better when they become groups online. So if some of these, so a lot of these students may well know each other, may well know the lecturer face to face. So in some ways that does give them a kind of a boost, if you like, from then moving online. So, um, um, so in some ways they're, they're not, they haven't got that kind of cold start of coming online, which can be tricky. So you've got Dominic saying his students are North Vietnamese, and they're not encouraged to share initiative, very passive learners, studying a second language again, yes, and that, that can be tricky, so I think. Um, 
Yes, <laughs> lots of issues. They go to solve all of your issues, Dominic. But, but I'm sure, and you know as much as I do about this kind of stuff. But I think that's kind of, you're right, you don't want to throw people in now, kind of do a massive online collaborative activity. It can just, so I think, you know, uh, so Brian Mann talks about Splot, the kind of smallest possible online learning uh, contribution. I think you can do aspects of that. So just simple things, first of all, that are kind of just, some way of communicating, some way of just getting people online to you know, share a picture of outside your house or something. You know, I'm just thinking so, sort of fairly sim simple things that don't require much, at least to kind of get some comfort with being online, I think. Uh, Ken uh, says, I found that with my online students, I'm able to connect even more with them. I could share a little bit my perspective about that. That great. Thank you, Ken. So uh, Ken's coming from uh, Mexico. So I'm going to give you a microphone, Ken. And... Uh, yeah. So Ken, if you roll your mouse over where you can see my big bearded face, a little microphone icon should pop up and then you click on that and it goes green and you should be able to speak. There we go. I think I got Hi, it. Ken. Did that work? Yeah, good. Thanks. Um, so I've... Um, been teaching here in Mexico for about 25 years, mostly face-to-face, uh, -face, but I started teaching online back in October. One thing I've found um, is that this online, it's a combination of synchronous and asynchronous, so we are have been using Zoom, but I found the connections I've been able to make to my students has been actually very empowering. I've always found that um, there's the students that hide in the back of my room. I don't give big lecture halls. I usually have about 30 students max. But there's the ones that can easily hide in your classroom. And I've found with this kind of Brady Bunch uh, view that I have in Zoom, it really helps to see the students' faces. And even right now, when Martin's talking to me with this presentation, I've got a really good view of Martin's face, right? I, I can see the salt and pepper beard. I can see the shirt he's wearing. I can get a lot of context that really helps while I'm talking with my students. And 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 I hope I can give that kind of context to them as well. So I've, I found a a really good chance. And there's a, another um, thing I've been doing for about five years now with all of my classes that I uh, quote unquote um, force my students to come visit me one on one, whether that's in the coffee shop or in my office or online. Um, and I found that that one to one contact has been really important for me during um, my classes, whether it's about the academics or whether it's students that have problems they need someone to talk about. Um, and I've continued that with my online as well, and it's it's really helped me make connections with my students. That's about it. Great, thanks, Kim. I should have enabled, enabled camera as well for people, so you can't just see. It's not just me and my. That's all right. You can Google me. I'll, you'll find me somewhere. <laughs> uh, so Julia asks, uh, what might be the best way to nurture student peer support to become autonomous? How best for students to build a community of practice online? And get to know and support each other, especially over a long period of time. Um, I'm going to let someone else talk about that. Uh, does anybody want to answer that one? Okay, I'm going to let Tom speak about that one. It seems to me that Tom is keen to speak. Tom's coming from Ireland. Tom, you have microphone access. Yes, Tom, so you go up to me, roll your mouse up where I am, you can see my face, and a little green, a little microphone icon should pop up that would be red yeah. there, okay. Good, Here we go. Yep, cool. Yep. Hi, Tom. Grant, um, hi, hi everybody uh, from Kerry. Um, yeah, I, I I like the uh, the groups function in, in well, it's, it's Blackboard that, that we use, but I'm, I'm sure the other VLEs have that. So uh, I use it in two ways. First, when I'm doing a live session, uh, like on Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, I will break them out into different tasks and then I'll sort of jump in and out. I think one of the things, so if you're going to use groups, um, you really have to give them very, very good directions. So I'll sort of send them off and to discuss some element and then have somebody who's going to come back and present back. And that's where, you know, you're talking about where people mightn't like to um, speak up in the, in the big group, but within, within groups of three or four or five people, 
I find that they're, they're far more amenable to actually working and sharing and, and then coming back. And then in the asynchronous, once again, I'll set up discussion boards and that are in the, are in the groups. But once again, you give them very, very uh, good direction in terms of, of keeping. Otherwise, it'll either fall into nothingness or, or you'll kind of end up, as, as, as Martin says, the danger of um, in the group chat. I, and normally, I, I wouldn't go any more than five or six people. Uh, but as I said, you really have to be very clear about the rules, the roles, and the outcomes. That's all. Thanks, Tom. Um, and also, also, just go back to uh, Judah's original question. You know, there's quite a lot of ways to do this, I think, and also speaks to the point I was making to start making a kind of like sort of baby steps, I think. So, uh, one of the things I often do with my students is get them to blog results, uh, solutions to something, you know. To, either set them up on if you've got an institutional blog or just find you know, a free blog somewhere. So you know, part of an activity B will blog, uh, you know, just blog in less than 300 words, something to this, and then get them to comment on someone else's blog, you know, so they get used to kind of just talking to each other over a period of time. Um, and Nitrous is wikis as well, yeah, so kind of get them to group or even just Google Docs, you know. So trying to build up that trust in a non threatening way first of all so like not the first time i get to work with each other is when there's you know 50 percent of their overall mark hanging on it you know and, uh, before that person doesn't do the work but then i think after a while they particularly if you kind of build in that throughout that kind of approach throughout or um, having on the structure it can be e-portfolios but just getting people to share um, and one of the things you can do is um pull together everyone so you can do it in a forum as well you know like so if you make a task go away and find a resource about this and say why you think that resource is good then comment on someone else's resource um, and then you pull those together they kind of get that sense of you know building up uh, knowledge together as part of the kind of enterprise uh, okay good anybody else want to come in uh, anybody got a question hands up advice they want to offer uh, if you had one key tip to give somebody who was about to uh have to teach online on how to support students what would it be chill is that <laughs> okay Nigel persevere keep it simple those are good tips actually I think uh, Tina's keep it simple is it, very good actually um you know I think Someone once joined the Open University from another university, face-to-face -face university, and I think I've told the story last week. But they have they had this kind of group activity, which took an afternoon usually. And I was saying, this is really complex when you try to do it online. You know, so you would need to assign roles, then someone else would have to agree. If someone disappears for a week, you know, you don't know where they are, um, and actually getting people to agree those tasks, which might be a five-minute role, face-to-face, -face, takes a week or something online. So you know what sometimes i think people think they're kind of dumbing it down a bit online but it's not so much that it's kind of it's just understanding the the extra cognitive load that i think uh, the student has to bring to it uh, keep it simple don't be hard on yourself tom says um, patience and empathy i think from students too as well that can be very very useful I meant to add in something just because we're talking about, I think there's a kind of a distinct difference between where we are now, um, where we're going to be in a few months. So uh, Phil Hill, who's uh, an ed tech writer in the US, was talking about the kind of four stages of the, the online pivot or the COVID-19 response from higher education. And the first was the kind of panic rush to Zoom the second will be kind of a more of an enterprise response where we start using people's VLEs and stuff. The third will be thinking sort of medium term, you know, what happens in September, are we going to teach all online? And the fourth are kind of more long term uh, response kind of post this as well. And I think partly a lot of these things at the moment, you know, a lot of you are dealing with that. What do I do now? You know, I've got to put this stuff online next week, but also at the same time, you're going to have to start thinking, 
at least in those sort of phases two and three and maybe even four. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it is Pam in a way. I don't think it's a Pam asked, do you think that this is a paradigm shift for learning? I think certainly it's shifted online learning kind of really front and center, isn't it? You know, um, and I think, you know, lots of universities will go back to face to face afterwards. Um, but equally, I think they're just going to go, a lot of this stuff works online now. Um, and we know it works online. And I think just for lots of things, that, there's that joke that goes around, you know, that it turns out that this meeting could have been an email after all. And I think there might be a lot of that. Why are we getting together to do the stuff? It turns out we can do it online. Um, so Stephen says, be yourself and embrace the qualities and affordances of the intimacy and the distance simultaneously. That's very, that's very poetic, Stephen. I don't know if you want to elaborate on that. But it's true, I think. So um, you know, the affordances, are that you know you can work asynchronously you know people can contribute and do different things they can find re different resources um and it's both intimate and that you kind of get to know people over a long time as well and sort of be part of their lives and as nigel was saying you know, some of us from of course uh 20 years ago that still know each other and stuff um but also it does give you that distance so you know people aren't you're not sharing the house with these people all the time so i think that So, so Don, so some of my students are sharing the house with the whole family, chickens, babies, pets, whatever. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so I think that's the problem, isn't it? So that goes back to the sort of advice I was putting out earlier. And I think if if possible, you've got to try and um, have some boundaries and some agreements. You know, this is my time to go and study or when when this sign is up or when I'm doing this, don't interrupt me. And, you know, um, and just get agreement from the, from the family. Don't try and sort of wing it around them. If, if possible, I'm not sure. If you've got a three-year-old, I'm not sure they're they're necessarily going to sign the uh, the contract agreement. But <laughs> okay, I mean, that's why I'm not talking. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to get so used to that, aren't we? It's like having meetings where children come in <laughs> to the middle of the meeting and stuff. That's good. I like it. It's all part of life, isn't it? Yeah, so Emma says it feels like we have to share a bit more about our personal lives to build that relationship that isn't so necessary when face to face. And I think that's true, but also we need to be careful. So we don't want to pressure people into having to share things about themselves. You know, like, um, we often have OU students who are coming from you know, particular backgrounds or experiences where they, they really don't want to share anything, you know, and, and for very uh, sort of valid reasons. Um, so you need to be very careful about, you know, post a picture of yourself online or something, you know, so that those types of icebreaker activities, um, you, you need to be quite careful about it, quite, quite sensitive to people's different uh, setups and, and, and experiences. So um, you know, that's why some of the kind of more pseudo ones that work out, I think some, I think Anne said, you know, if you're an animal, what you'd be, or those kind of things. Here's three things that are true about me and one false one or something. Um, so someone says that's what they don't do, two truths and a lie. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, so you can sort of force you to have to reel about yourself. So I might ask someone, I'm going to ask you to speak, Nigel, about that, you know, getting that balance right, even if you don't want to. If anyone else wants to chip in, that's good. Yeah, actually, your microphone's still on if you want, Nigel. Can you hear me now? Yeah, cool. Hey, the two truths and a lie thing, I, it's the culture that the, the university the ou we uh, adult learners and as you know i used to work with students in prison or students who'd just been released from prison i don't want to ask a group of prisoners to, for two truths and a lie because that's just a world of pain but what we can do and what i tend to try and do with my online groups is to start them on the easy stuff that they're not worried about giving away so all my group is based in Kent, Surrey or sussex so i'll say where what's the biggest town near where you live so you don't say I live in Hailsham or I live in this little village here. You say I live near Canterbury, I live near Brighton and then build them up to the harder stuff where you're saying, did you understand that bit of the module? Did you understand this question here? So rather than putting them on the spot, it's give them an opportunity like like this session here. Once people start talking, they're more open about talking more. Getting them over that beginning bit is the bit that's difficult. Um, 
very open is expressive, but we don't need to give everything away. So people, I do quite a lot online, as, as Martin does, and people say, well, I know everything you've ever done. And like, no, you don't. You only know what I've chosen to tell you, and I'm quite careful about what I choose to tell people. It seems that I'm putting a lot out, but I'm not telling people a lot about my personal stuff. It's just I put a lot out. Does that cover what you wanted, Martin? Yes, thanks, Nigel. I think some important points there, just kind of having to be sensitive about those things. So Tom says, his, when I start a call to the new global, I ask all the students to tell me their connectivity speed, at least that way I have an appreciation of potential pitfalls and what I can and can't do. And it's also just an easy thing to get them to, to contribute. You know, it's like that they've kind of got over that hurdle. Emma says, in a face-to-face -face environment, I get students to prepare and draw each other what the subject tells the person drawing about themselves. At the start of this webinar, I thought that might be a good idea, but now I think maybe not. No, I think you might be right. I mean, it's like, you know, if, if they don't know each other already from face to face, kind of pairing people up can be quite tricky. So you're probably better at that stage, kind of, you, know, you might want to get them to draw themselves as an animal or something and share that picture or something and, and explain why. But I think, um, yeah, particularly if people don't know each other, you, you don't, you want to avoid, because people can easily misunderstand things, I think, online. It's like, why have you drawn me like that? <laughs> Which is kind of be is more easy to negotiate face to face. Um, don't see my students are very proud of their hometown. They're generally proud of their family, their country history. They're pitifully shy when it comes to answering questions or even comments and discussion. Yeah. So I think you've got a, a building up thing to do there, Dominic, haven't you? I guess. Um, but maybe the, you know it's. You can work on the things that you say they do like to talk about, you know, like into So Kathy, it's an important thing about security and set things up for students. E.g. in Zoom, use a room link with a password embedded so you only get the attendees you invite. Yes, lots of that in the news at the moment. I, I was couldn't believe <laughs> was this right? So the government were using Zoom. And they posted a picture with the with the link on it. Does the government not have a more kind of secure system than Zoom? Is like, they not down some kind of Ministry of Defence system we're using here? That sounds bizarre. Uh, Amanda says a slide a slide a slide is useful in assessing feelings. It's anonymous on a whiteboard, and you can talk generically about an issue. Yes, yeah, so you can do voting and things. Uh, Emma says, stayed away from Zoom so far. Um, actually, I think uh, Blackboard Collaborate is um, okay, actually. Yeah, I, I don't know why. what the big rush to Zoom was. I've been spending a day in a conference in um, um, in Blackboard, and it's been great, yeah. I prefer it to Zoom. Zoom's good for exercise, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. So Kathy says, I uh, always remember the how are you feeling poll. So, which I didn't, I asked how you feel, but I could have done a poll, which would have been better. Yeah. Particularly if they can do that uh, anonymously. Okay, good. Any other hands raised? Do you want to raise the hand? Remember, it's down the bottom right if you want to speak. Or uh, questions, specific questions. Oh, I was going to say, what did I have planned for next week? Um, I was gonna. I was thinking we could talk about assessment next week, but my other option. I need to put that in. It's question marks against all of these. Or well, the other one was course design, straight pedagogy, and the last one, longer term plan structure. Um, I don't know if people have any thoughts on next week. Thanks, Dominic. Finally, Nigel, you're right. Finally, in the world is waking up. We can use this internet thing. Learning. Yeah, sorry, Emma, if we've now given you more problems <laughs> than you thought you had. <laughs> That's often the way, isn't it? But, um, so assessment would be great, Pam. I'm taking one one vote as a as a affirmation. That's what we should do. So I'll try and if I, see if I can getting some of my uh, colleagues who know about assessment. Okay, thanks, Ken. So Ken says uh, he's running um, weekday coffee sessions for educators, open to anyone. 
starts two hours from now. Thanks, Ken. I'll add that. I, what I will do is I'll uh, export this chat and add in any links into things. I'll do a blog post to write it up. Yeah, you're right. So Claire says, very assessments, especially alternative assessments can be done now online. I think that with this, there was stuff last week about people just reverting to exams and uh, doing these kind of proctoring things to make sure it's the person giving the exam and that there's just been all sorts of pain with that. So um, let's go with assessment and different ways of thinking about that. Good. Shall we wrap it up there? If I'm happy, I hope everyone's okay. I might see some of you in here next week. Um, feel free to point out to one. Sorry, Tom, did you want to speak? I've just noticed your hand was up. Uh, you, you do still have microphone access, so feel yeah. free to speak. Very quickly, I thought about you, but I think a lot of colleges seem to have gone on trajectory. The first week when all this happened was how do we start getting content up there? How do we start now? How do we start running online classes? And I think certainly in our college, it's all about assessment now and trying to replace that with exams. So I think you'd be, you're bang on when you say about the assessment, because I think people are obsessed about proctoring. And I think we need to think about other ways of doing it. So. Yeah, I think you're I just want to say, I don't, I'm just interested, are other people on the same sort of trajectory now? Just that, that, I was just wondering. No, I think you're right, Tom. That's kind of the first panic was, you know, let's just carry on, you know, the kind of continuity thing. But then people now think, okay, how are we going to run this stuff in terms of exams and assessments? So I'll see if I can rope in some people for that. Good. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to export the chat now. So don't add anything interesting into chat. Thanks, everyone, and I'll see you next week, hopefully. I'm going to stop.